Welcome everyone to QB Power Hour. Today's Thursday, July 26. And today's episode is value creation and pricing your accounting services based on value. The agenda, we'll talk briefly about QB Power Hour and the sponsors and the host. We'll talk about the CPE process and then we'll get right into the content, which should be about an hour overall, hence the name QB Power Hour. So QB Power Hour, it's an hour uh, webinar series. We usually do it twice a month. We are on the every other Thursday schedule. So we can expect pretty much for the rest of the year for it to be every other Thursday. The next episode will be August 9th. We don't have a topic for that yet, but it'll most likely be a QuickBooks online topic. On August 23rd, we'll be doing e-commerce and sales tax challenges post Wayfair ruling. And that has to do with sales tax in, in, in a nutshell. And uh, on the eight, on the 6th of September, if uh, QuickBooks desktop comes out and it's usually scheduled to come out on the 5th or on the 6th, we'll be doing a what's new on QuickBooks desktop. If it doesn't come out, we'll probably postpone it to uh, the other, the second Thursday um, of that uh, month, and then we'll figure out what to do with the ninth. Uh, typically, we cover tips and tricks and advanced topics in uh, in uh, QuickBooks Online, QuickBooks Desktop, and in every, in every other episode, we try to do a third-party app or a practice management topic, such as the one that we're doing now. Michelle Long is the co-host of this webinar series. She's not uh, uh, logged in yet. Uh, she says she was going to log in later on to try to answer some uh, polling questions. She's an international speaker for Intuit. Check out her uh, books in Amazon and her LinkedIn group that has over 160,000 people. About myself, my name is uh, Hector Garcia. I'm a CPA uh, based out of Miami, Florida. I have my office and my classroom where I teach QuickBooks down there. I also do a lot of YouTube videos and uh, in podcasts, uh, sort of all over the place in social media. There's my email address and my Twitter handle if you want to communicate with me directly. About the CPE process, these are CPE eligible webinars, which means if you attend live uh, via GoToWebinar and you are avail you're logged in for at least 50 minutes and you answer three out of the four polling questions, we'll automatically email you a CPE certificate. Uh, usually takes about two or three weeks, sometimes faster, sometimes slower, but they do get there eventually. Now, this is a plug, and let me just uh, I I warn you, this is advertising, okay? I'm advertising. This is the sponsor of the webinar myself. I have a three-hour webinar on value pricing in which I'm going to uh, deep dive into a lot of these specifics and techniques and examples that is going to be a one-time only uh, webinar on Thursday, August 30th, between 12 p.m. and 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the webinar will be $300, will be limited to 50 attendees. The recording will be available if you can attend the live, if you paid. The, to register, go to valuepricing.net and use the coupon code July 100 to get $100 off before uh, July 31st. So this is an advertised space. We don't have a a specific third-party vendor as a sponsor for this webinar. So I'm using uh, this space to sponsor my own paid webinar that I'm doing, and I'll talk about it again uh, at, towards the end. These are the topics that we'll be covering in that webinar. And uh, just so you know, this one, the one that we're doing now, is going to be sort of a preview to that or a prelude to that. And I'll, and I'll kind of hint at a couple of things that we'll be covering in that long webinar. But the idea is that this webinar, today's webinar, by itself, it's going to be useful enough, even if you don't take the three-hour paid webinar afterwards, uh, it will be uh, useful enough. And that webinar will also be uh, CPE eligible as well. So we'll be giving CPE certificates on that one. Anyway, these are today's topics. We'll be talking about some of the inspiration and resources for value pricing information. This is where I get my information from and where I have studied uh, at the source on value pricing. I'll talk about why value pricing is so popular, quote unquote. I would say popular amongst uh, practitioners more than uh, more than customers, but that's that's still arguable. We'll talk about what we like to call the six opportunities uh, to create value, and, and that's uh, and that's particularly important uh, because th there are there are plenty of opportunities uh, that you have to create value during engagement, but the the ones that uh, the six that I will mention, I I happen to, in my opinion think that these are the most important ones, uh, at least the ones you, you should be aware of when designing your strategy for marketing yourself, uh, especially if you're going to do value pricing. Then we'll talk about nine rules for successful value pricing implementation. And again, there's probably more rules than that, but these are my rules. 
And we'll talk about some useful tools uh, that you can use during the value conversation, especially to price complex projects. The number one feedback I get from anyone trying to implement value pricing is, Hector, it is so hard to price projects in which I don't know what's going to happen or I don't know how long it's going to take me or I don't know what the scope is just because all the information that's been given to me feels incomplete or I just know from experience that stuff is going to come out later on. So we'll talk about that. So the the six books I recommend that has really shaped the way I think about uh, providing professional services are Ron Baker's Implementing Value Pricing. I would say that book alone, it's, it's strong enough. Then Alan uh, Weiss's value-based fees, and he, he, he uh, Ron Baker takes it a lot from the accounting perspective or the professional firm perspective. Uh, Alan Weiss is more about the consultant coaching perspective. Tim Williams' book, Positioning for Professionals, is excellent. It's sort of the advertising marketing guide for anyone that does value pricing. So it's actually a great book. Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play by Mahan Khalsa, great book about salesmanship and about you know, transformation in your, the buyer-seller relationship, whether you sell products or services. Uh, Joseph Pines, The Experience Economy, great book to get you thinking about what's next and how people think and how people buy. And Peter Block's Flawless Consulting. Uh, so these six books, I think that they're, 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 they have been fundamental in shaping how I think about value pricing and think about professional services. There's also five podcasts I recommend if you're a podcast type of person. Uh, the Soul of Enterprise, Art of Value, Two Bobs, Ditching Hourly, and my own podcast called The Art of Advisory. So that's sort of uh, more of a source and an inspiration because technically I can't inspire myself. So if you're a podcast person, check out those five podcasts. Now, in the slides, uh, there's uh, five links I recommend you check out. There's a PDF document from Ron Baker's Pricing on Purpose Guide, great guide to use. Uh, there is a sample package PDF document that Intuit put together, which has to do with just an example on how to present options to your customers. Ron Baker's four-part webinar, there's the link for that, and that, that's going to be like eight hours worth of video. Uh, my own uh, sort of summarized version of that, which is my 36-page value guide and my three-page cheat sheet. So those resources alone should make uh, this webinar uh, worth it if, you, if they're not available to you. So let's talk about why hourly pricing is so popular, and I, and I put in parentheses, amongst practitioners, because I really haven't met a whole bunch of customers that love to pay by the hour. But why is it so popular? One, because the risk is shifted to the customer. Practitioners love not taking risk, and they love shifting the risk to the customer. The other, and I think this is a misconception, is it's easy to measure profitability. So a lot of practitioners think that when you charge by the hour, it's easy to measure profitability. I'm gonna, and I'm gonna disprove that on the next exercise because I'm gonna show you a spreadsheet in which I show you how to quote unquote measure profitability on hourly pricing and you're gonna see how complicated really it is. And it's really just a misconception that it's easy to measure profitability. The, the other one is easy to use for quoting or pricing rates, right? Somebody calls you and says how much, how much you charge. You say $200 an hour. It took you two seconds to do that. And a lot of us are, uh, I mean, a lot of practitioners just prefer the easy route to just say an hourly rate and now actually say, well, it depends. Let's spend two hours to figure out how much I'm going to charge for your services. And that's really the challenge is you have to, uh, you know, give it a lot of thought. And of course, the next one is doesn't require much thought from both the practitioner and the customer. So this is not uh, me attacking a practitioner from saying they use an hourly fee because they don't want to think. It's not the case. We also don't want to make our customers think because a lot of us sort of feel that if we make the customers think too much, uh, they get analysis but not paralysis and then they don't, they don't move forward. And, and I think it's one of the, 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 the worst ones yet. And I, and I, I tell you, I, I will admit to being a culprit of this, is the rate becomes a status sim, uh, symbol. So a lot of practitioners started by charging $50 an hour, $100 an hour, $200 an hour, whatever it happens to be. And, and, and as you raise that rate, it sort of becomes a status symbol or some, something that proves that you have experience and knowledge. And it's hard to get away from that as a practitioner. Trust me, I started from charging $25 an hour uh, 10 years ago, and now I charge $350, equivalent to $350 for one hour. Um, and it's hard to get away from that status symbol that you can 
uh, command that rate. And that's, what, that's why hourly fee becomes even more popular for folks that are at that rate. Especially you see some attorneys and some sort of international CPAs that are charging four, five hundred dollars an hour. It's hard to get them away from hourly billing just because that status symbol is so ingrained in, in their head. But for, uh, for accountants and bookkeepers that haven't gotten quite there yet, it's easier to shift to value-based pricing because the rate is already, in my opinion, so low. I mean, if you're charging, if you're an expert in QuickBooks accounting and tax and you're charging less than $100 an hour, regardless of where you are geographically located and your circumstances, I hear a whole bunch of excuses in terms of why people can't charge more. I think that you're overcharging, undercharging uh, because that knowledge is really valuable. So anyway, so let's talk about, uh, I, I put a spreadsheet together to make the case for why people or why a lot of practitioners think hourly pricing is so popular. So let me uh, minimize this for a second. And uh, let's open the spreadsheet. And this spreadsheet is on your handout so you can see it and try to follow along. So let me explain how this spreadsheet works. And, and, and the purpose of this is so you can play with it yourself and kind of get an idea. So I found that accountants love spreadsheets and, I can't, and QuickBooks people still love spreadsheets. So putting a spreadsheet together you know, just for somehow, somehow it, it sings in and people love it. But what I did with the spreadsheet is just put together a quick box where you put all your, let's call it your office overhead. So all your expenses that are in parentheses overhead. And we put that there and we add that number up. And then I put, I'm making the assumption that in this case, we have the owner of the firm and, a, and, and one employee, right? So I'm putting the, the, you know, what the owner of the firm pays themselves in terms of sort of a fixed salary uh, before taxes and because taxes get more complicated. So I'm putting the owner's salary before taxes and then the employee salary after taxes. So we come up with a monthly operating expense of 12,500. Then how do we figure out uh, if we are in an hourly based billing um, business model, how do we figure out what our hourly cost is? And this is, this is how I figured it out, right? So first we figure out how many hours can an employee work in a month. And I'm assuming they work eight hours a day, five, five times, uh, I mean, five days a week. That's 168 hours on the average month. Then I use what's called the billing billable time capacity, which is realistically how many hours of the day can an employee spend on actual hourly billing, right? Because a lot of times we're answering the phone and responding emails and doing admin work, or sometimes we're spending time time tracking or invoicing, that sort of thing. So we, 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 we put a percentage there. You can put whatever percentage you want, right? 75% if realistically six out of eight hours are billable. And that gives you what I call the effective billable hours. That's that number that you see there, the effective billable hours. So you take the effective billable hours and you divide that by uh, the portion of the overhead that we can allocate, quote unquote, to that employee. I'm simply just dividing all the overhead by all the employees because in the accounting business or in most uh, knowledge-based business where they charge by the hour, uh, the most valuable thing is the employee's time anyway. So we take uh, all the overhead divided by the number of employees, which is the calculation you see there, uh, plus we take the, the employee's salary and I divide that by the effective um, billable hours and then it gives me my quote-unquote effective, effective hourly cost. So once you know your effective hourly cost, then you can attach your hourly rate to that, whatever it happens to be, let's say 75, and then you get more or less a profit per billable hour um, and then we multiply that profit per billable hour times the total number of effective billable hours we have in the month. So it, it tells you that from this one employee, we can profit $3,400 a month. And again, that's assuming that the, the percentage of billable capacity is there and the number of clients are taking up that entire billable capacity. Then we take the owner's time and I made the assumption that owners work a bunch of overtime and maybe they have a le lesser billable capacity, right? Because they spend some time marketing and admin stuff and stuff like that. We multiply, uh, we take the billable hours, divide that by their effective costs, figure out what the owner is going to charge per hour, the profit per hour. So then we have our total uh, uh, profit per hour here. And then we, uh, I basically took 30% for tax and then annualize it to figure out what the net income after taxes to the owner would be. So when you take a spreadsheet like this, this in paper looks easy. It looks 
uh, really well uh, uh, put together. It's allocated. But again, this is a, a spreadsheet that I put together. We can we can mess with these numbers, mess with these numbers, mess with these numbers. These numbers are dynamic. They can change every single month. That is a huge challenge with uh, th this whole concept that, that it is true, that it is easy to predict profitability. It is not easy to predict profitability. There's a lot of numbers that are sort of fluffed in when making such a calculation. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a guesstimate at best, in my opinion, when it comes to uh, you know, making that statement that it is easy to predict profitability with hourly rates. So hopefully the, the, the spreadsheet itself, even if you're never gonna implement value pricing and you use the spreadsheet to figure out what your billable rate is, that's great. I mean, I think, uh, I think it'll be useful either way. You know, feel free to add more to the spreadsheet, email it to me if you found some errors on it or if you think you should add more stuff to it. I would love to see what you do with the spreadsheet afterwards. Anyway, so, um, so the value of that spreadsheet was, again, get you in the mindset that uh, is, there, you know, is there a way to easily figure out what your cost is with hourly billing? In my opinion, the answer is no. Now, why is hourly pricing so unpopular amongst customers? So now I'm going to make the case against what I'm teaching on the spreadsheet. Uh, number one, it is a lousy customer service experience. And what I, what I mean by that is it's, it's, it's most customers want to know what they're buying and how much they're paying. The minute that they're looking at hours and they're looking at how you account for hours and how you track those hours as a way to figure out whether or not they're getting the money's worth, uh, to me, that's it, just a lousy customer experience. Secondly, there's a, f a feeling of surprise when the bill comes in. I mean, sometimes they may, be, they may be pleasantly surprised that the bill was less than the last month and they're not going to say anything. But then when the bill is more than the previous month, they're obviously going to say something, right? So it's, that feeling of surprise is just not great. I mean, I don't, I don't know who likes that feeling of not knowing what the bill is going to come out to. The other one is... Um, it gives the feeling of, of, of nickel and diming. Whoops. Uh, let me make a quick correction here. I meant hourly billing, not hourly pricing, because the word, the word price is really tied to a fixed price, not uh, hourly. Anyway, um, so it gives the feeling of, of, of nickel and diming. And what I mean by that is if you charge for a 15-minute conversation, if you, if you charge for a 30-minute conversation, that sort of thing, um, and, and, you, and, you're, and it's itemized on your invoice. It gives you that feeling for sure. And the last one I think is the most important one. It is not a differentiator. I think that's the biggest problem that uh, people will put you in that bucket where they compare you to someone else charging by the hour. And the only number they may, the only thing that they may have to compare you is that number. And to me, it's a big issue. Like just being compared through a number is sort of the antithesis of being a professional. So let's, uh, let's take a quick break to run a polling question. And I would like to know, where are you in value pricing? Where are you in your journey of value pricing? So this is the, um, the second polling question. We'll do a total of four polling questions. You only need to answer three in order to get your CPE certificate. So if you missed the first one, no big deal. So where are you in the journey of value pricing? Where are you? in value pricing. So where are you in the journey of value pricing? Okay, and I wanna add a couple of, uh, I wanna just add some comments here. So uh, Linda says that uh, the Art of, Val Art of Advisory podcast is one of her favorites. She listens to it in the morning. Thank you, Linda, for that comment. Keith says that when you undercharge, you hurt, uh, it hurts the rest of us. That's a good one, right? Because you're basically driving the whole uh, 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 cost down on the industry. I actually don't think you should be charging any hourly rate whatsoever. But um, somebody says that there's a lot more billable time during tax season compared to summer. That's interesting. You know, I would love to know why there's more bill uh, hourly during tax season rather than the non-busy times. Um, Somebody says the big question: When somebody asks you for your hourly rate, how do you how do you answer? But I think the answer is, I think the answer is I don't have one. <laughs> so Megan's asking: When the customer asks you what's your hourly rate, what should your answer be? I think the answer is I don't have one. I think that's it. That's just the answer. I don't have one. And the customer says, "Huh, that's refreshing." 
what do you mean? Expand more. And then you have, I think in conversation, you will have more power on that conversation because now the customer is forced to ask you, well, how do you price then? And then now you have sort of an open field to discuss your pricing strategy. So um, how much you charge by the hour? I think the answer is I don't have one. And stay quiet. Stay quiet and wait to see what the customer says. Okay, so let me close the polling question, share the results, give you a, a, an idea more or less. Uh, and a couple of episodes ago, we talked about the Intuit uh, rate survey. I think it was a, the previous episode, actually. So we kind of uh, showed uh, folks how um, how we uh, you know how the whole industry, or at least mostly QuickBooks Pro advisors, QuickBooks centric accounting professionals. Uh, price. So check out that episode. It's called Intuit Rate Survey 2018. So check it out. Uh, 47% of you have somewhat implemented uh, value pricing. 10% of you are all in and 25% of you are sort of nowhere still learning. Okay, that's great. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide here, which are the common myths and misconceptions of value pricing. And I like to demystify a lot of things that I, especially when I go to conferences or I talk with, to colleagues of people that tell me, oh yeah, I value price because of this, right? Don't value price because of this. So let's start. Number one is some people feel that value pricing means we're practicing price gouging. Now, price gouging is that sort of pejorative uh, term that we use for, for example, there's a hurricane and the folks that uh, bring water you know, to people in need charge three, four or five dollars a bottle. And that's quote unquote price gouging. Now, wh why is that price gouging? Because it, it feels like the that the person selling the product is taking advantage of the uniqueness and of the situation and the scarcity to charge more. And I think there's nothing. I mean, look, I, I think that taking advantage of an unfortunate situation is sort of a borderline unethical thing. But I don't think in professional services we're, we're price gouging because if you have a unique offering, if you are poised to specialize for, on that particular customer, if you've made it your life's work to be prepared for that moment that you're right there ready to help that client and you price more than anybody else would because you're in a better situation, I don't think that's price gouging. I mean, I think that's... And, and by the way, you're not... Accounting is not a necessity, life or death decision, like buying water. So value pricing is but is not price gouging at all. So that's one of the big myths and misconceptions. The other misconception is value pricing is about charging more. It is not about charging more. As a matter of fact, it, that's, that whole concept is wrong. Value pricing is about setting the price commensurate to the value the customer is getting. In some cases, it means charging less. Because value pricing is not about raising your fees. It's about tying your fees with uh, what the customer gets out of you or, or, or just under what the customer gets out of you. So it's not about charging more. It's absolutely not about charging more. Now, a great consequence about a value pricing mindset is that you will charge more. A great consequence is that you will have a little bit more freedom to charge the same or more than before and not have to work as much. It's a great consequence of becoming more effective uh, with your results that you bring rather than trying to just be efficient in working faster, right? right? And you don't get penalized for getting faster and better over time. So it's not about charging more. It's, it's a great consequence of it, but it's not about charging more. It's not what the principle it's about. Now, some people think that because they offer bundles or package services, it means they're value pricing. That is not true. That is not true, okay? Value pricing means you understand what the value that you're bringing is. That's the only thing that value pricing means. So it's not about bundles or packages, absolutely not about that. It's also not about just fixed rates. A lot of people think that charging a fixed rate, it's value pricing. Now, all value pricing must be a fixed price stated up front, a fixed price stated up front, or maybe a price tied to a result of some sort. That's true value pricing. However, not all fixed rates are value pricing because some people put prices on the website at fixed rates, and then they give it to, the, uh, to every customer they see. And that's actually the opposite of value pricing because that's actually a fixed rate that you're offering to everyone. So 
That's a really common one. And the last one is the value pricing is designed to benefit the service provider. And the answer is no. Value pricing is designed to be a win-win strategy where both the customer and the service provider maximize the situation. So it's not about uh, benefiting the service provider. If anything, compared to the entire industry who's charging by the hour, I think it is designed to serve the customer better. Now let's talk about some general rules for successful value pricing implementation. And this is a combination between the academic uh, sort of information that's out there about value pricing and my own experiences as well. And, and we're going to spend a lot of time in the, in the, in the, big, in the long webinar on August 30th, uh, deep diving into each of these. But one of the rules is periodic renewals, is you don't take any relationships for granted. Uh, every single time that you're done with the length of that engagement, which is typically an hour or something, I mean, a, a year or something like that, that your relationship is up for grabs and you're open to renegotiating and you're open to talking about what the next year will look like. So you need to be on a periodic renewal, whether it's every six months, every quarter. I, mean, I think every month or every quarter may not be enough time. So I think every six months to a year, it's a great time to do renewals. Insurance companies do it every six months. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't think using the insurance company model would be a bad one. Also, services are priced, not billed, okay? There's something called value billing, which is, a, which is you don't give a price to the client up front. You do the service and then you give them a price at the end based on some fair assessment of what you think the customer should pay. That's not value pricing. I mean, that's some form of fixed rate pricing after the fact. And you're using the client's trust to, um, you know, to, to pass judgment in terms of what you should charge them. And a lot of us do this with our relationships with our really good clients that have really good relationships is we fix price after the service is done uh, based on some combination of hourly and what the customer is willing to pay. Value pricing means your price upfront, you don't bill on arrears. Also, there needs to be a fixed price service agreement, right? Not an engagement letter, a fixed price service agreement that explains what are we gonna do, what are we not going to do, what is uh, explicitly excluded from the, from the engagement, what is explicitly included, what are the desired outcome, in some cases a guaranteed result, is there a guarantee, are terms put in place, who's supposed to pay, who's supposed to, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very long agreement, it's not a long, but it's a comprehensive agreement in terms of what the service will be and what the price will be, it will not be tied to time in any way, shape or form. Also, there needs to be a guarantee, Right? In order for customers to pay a price for something at any point in time, they have to, they have to get something in guarantee. Right? When people go to a, a store, they feel that there is some sort of safety behind buying in that store because there's a return policy. That's the guarantee. Or when they buy anything from any manufacturer, there's a warranty. So there, there's some sort of guarantee that has to be tied. Services is hard because you can't really return services right? That's a hard one, right? Uh, you can't return services. So what do we guarantee? Well, we guarantee some sort of results or we give some people the money back or if, if they're not satisfied, something like that. Well, we'll you know, in, in, in the three-hour webinar, we'll, we'll discuss a lot of guarantees because that to me is one of the biggest ones. Uh, value is subjective. That's an important principle. You have got to get that in your head. Value is subjective. And we're gonna, I'm going to deep dive on this one on today's webinar, that's the only one I'll cover on today's webinar, because there's a lot of meat in there, so I think you get a lot of value from covering that in depth. Also, you wanna prioritize based on value. That's an interesting one. So what we wanna do is we want to figure out of all the things that we do, what's valuable to our customers, and we also wanna reorganize it based on the highest value to the lowest value, so we can spend more time on the high value outputting services and not spend so much on the low value outputting services. And a lot of times we think that things that we do add value, but they don't. Okay, typical cases, uh, reports with graphics. Almost every accounting professional I know thinks that giving a client a report with a bunch of graphics, it's a lot of value. And, and, and some customers value it and some customers don't. And that's just a really important one. Uh, also, uh, having a, a deep value conversation 
and understanding the why behind what the customer wants you to do, it's one of those really important rules because you can't, without the value conversation, you can't have a value pricing, right? So you need to understand the why behind what you're doing. Then you want to offer options. And we're going to spend a lot of time uh, deep diving on options on the, on the long webinar because that, that's actually an important skill set. We use, we use options, one, to gauge uh, what the customer values the most. We use options to create boundaries around, hey, to want more means to pay more. And it's a very explicit way to illustrate that concept. So explaining, I mean, offering options and three options are the magic number. After the value conversation, that's key. And the most important one is transferring or leveraging risk. All profit comes from risk. The more risk you take as a service professional, the more profits you can get. Also, the more you can lose. And that's how risk works. Um, but this is the spirit of entrepreneurship. And accounting professionals and business consultants charging by the hour are going against the spirit of entrepreneurship and they're sending all the risk back to their customers by charging them based on your time. So you want to leverage that risk and transfer it to you in order to increase your profits or increase the value. Believe it or not, transferring that risk is very valuable. Now, let's talk about uh, value is subjective. So this is number five that we're going to deep dive on. Um, and again, on the, on, the, on the long webinar, we'll deep dive in all nine of them. So let's deep dive on this because I think this is probably the most important one. So I picked this one to be the, the one that we covered today. One is value is subjective and pricing is contextual. Okay, value is subjective, pricing is contextual. That means that the price will vary based on the situation and the perception of value will be both driven by the situation and by the price. So let me explain. When you are in a movie theater and you pay $5 for, for popcorn that costs 25 cents in the supermarket, most of us feel it's, it's so expensive, right? Um, but it is contextual because I am accompanying my movie experience with you know, a $5 popcorn. A lot of times, although it's sort of a ridiculous margin that they're making in it, the context that I'm out there enjoying it, you know, I only go, get to go to the movies once or twice a month. So do I care about that the Coke is $4 or the popcorn is $5 while I'm out there with my wife and somebody's taking care of my four kids? I don't. It is also absolutely contextual. But if I'm, you know, in, in the middle of the street and there's a, pop, a, a popcorn cart, and it's not within the context of me being out of the movies and enjoying it, and they try to charge me $5 for popcorn, I will never buy it. I will never buy it. So value is subjective, but also pricing is contextual. And the context and the situation affects both the perception of value and the price itself has the capacity to change the perception of value. I'll give you another example, Tesla. Okay, Tesla is a car company that has not been in the market for more than 10 years. Tesla charges four to five times, I would say, um, apples to apples in terms of what the car is for their vehicles. Yes, it's all electric and that sort of thing, but four to five times for potentially the same car in some other brand, and they are a, a brand that doesn't really have the, the, the pedigree to charge that much. They have no history on how long these cars last. It's new technology, but having the price be that high gives perception of value and they and they and they and they're strong with those prices and they don't negotiate that price they're, they're stern about their pricing that creates a perception of value the other one it's really important you price the customer not the service you price the customer not the service i can't stress this enough price the customer not the service a lot of people think that hey i'm gonna have a price list for all my tax returns and a C-Corp tax return with under $250,000 in sales or assets for one state will be 500 bucks. You're pricing the service. You're not pricing the customer. And the challenge with that is that tax return may be worth more or less to different folks depending on the situation. If somebody shows up on April 14th to get their tax return done and I need it done that day, 
that needs to be more expensive or they should be more expensive because it's more valuable to folks to get it done that day. Or if someone's in a hurry to get the tax returns done because they have to present a loan document that you have to get it done over the weekend, you're going to charge more because you're pricing the customer, you're pricing the situation, you're not pricing the service. Even if the service is the exact same as one you would price for half the price in a different circumstance. The third one is in the real world, debits do not equal credits. And if I was in a, in a conference somewhere, uh, somebody would throw a chair at me by just suggesting this. <laughs> in the real world, debits do not equal credits. And one of the important points I wanna make is, for example, let's say you have a pool and you have a, a pool guy that comes every month and for $80, they clean your pool, okay? A lot of accountants think that, hey, I have an $80 expense and the pool guy has an $80 income. That's how accountants think. But in the real world, it's not like that. Cleaning a pool, it's actually not that complicated. You know, you add a little bit of chlorine or, and I don't know, I don't even know what it takes, but honestly. But uh, to me, I prefer to do something else with my time than clean the pool. So I'm willing to pay $80 because that $80 is less, it's worth to me less than my time I don't have to spend cleaning the pool. That pool guy could have chosen a different career, could have taken the day off, could have you know, done something else with their time, but to them, the $80 I'm giving them is worth more than the time they're spending to clean the pool. In the real world, debits do not equal credits. A lot of folks have this zero-sum mentality where they think that transacting with your customers, it's an exact transfer of money, and it's not. It's a transfer of value. And the important thing is your customer pays you because what you do is worth more to them than the money they're paying you. And you accept the customer money because what you're doing, uh, the, the customer's money is worth more to you than the alternatives. And that's the important thing. Both parties can profit from every single transaction. And once you get that switch in your head, the value pricing just becomes much easier because again, in the real world, debits do not equal credits. The other one is the customer is the ultimate judge of value. Now, value is agreed upon both parties before work commencement, but the customer is the judge of value. So once the customer judges that value and is willing to pay, uh, then that's agreed upon both parties. Again, customer is the judge of value. Just because your time as a professional is valuable to you, doesn't mean that your time is valuable to your customers. And that's a really important piece. The value is what they get out of your work. And the last one is never use cost, labor, or time as a justification for price. Instead, use price as a justification of labor, time, and cost. This is the ultimate shift in mindset. Do not use cost, labor, or time or a justification of price. Use the price as a justification for labor, time, and cost. This is the ultimate shift in mindset. And what I mean by this is when you tell your client the service will be a thousand bucks and they say, why so much? You're not gonna say, well, because I have to spend 10 hours on it. Wrong. You say, that's the price, okay? I will invest my resources and my knowledge to get you the result that you want. That's the price, period. Don't use cost, labor, or time, a justification of price. And it's always the wrong thing to do because anytime you quote how long something takes you to do something, the customer com comes back and says what? I won't take you that long. It, it's, it's almost predictable that that's exactly how that conversation will go. I'll invite you to comment otherwise. But if you tell the client it will take me this much, half the times they say, shouldn't take you that much. It's not that complicated. So why even have that conversation? It, it just takes the whole thing in a different context. Okay, all right. So let's, uh, let's uh, quickly talk about the six opportunities to create value for your customers. And I'm gonna go through this rather quick because I wanna show you um, a, a very, uh, one of the best tools out there to actually price. But I'm gonna go through these and this is gonna be the core uh, of a lot of what we're gonna be talking about on August 30th on the Long Value Pricing webinar. So uh, these are the six opportunities. Your position in value. So this is everything that you do 
before you interact with a client for the first time. We're talking about your brand, your reputation, your marketing, your positioning, your specialization, your niche, what you do, what you don't do, your experience, everything that happens before you interact with that customer, it's an opportunity to create value, a really important one as well. The second one is the understanding or the scoping value. This is the value that you derive from making the customer feel that they understand me. This accountant understands me, understands, understands my business, understands my problem. This, custom, this uh, accountant understands my industry, understands my struggles. That is extremely valuable. And the value conversation, it's all about the, uh, creating that value. Then we have the performance or the experience value. This is the work that you perform that's visible to your customers and how they value that experience. The best, and this, this is sort of a comical one, but the best example I can think of is table side guacamole. Table side guacamole. When you order guacamole in any restaurant, it's $6. But table side guacamole is $12. It's the same guacamole. You will eat it <laughs> the same way. It will taste the same. But why is table side guacamole more expensive? It's because it has performance or experience value. People get to see the process. They see it happen. All these accountants and bookkeepers that are going on site to charge their clients need to make that their most expensive and premium service because watching somebody work, watching somebody work is the most valuable thing you can do to them. Kitchens that have an open, transparent view where you can see everything that's going on in the kitchen, they are 10 to 20% more expensive. Why? Because they have to spend extra time on making sure the kitchen is clean. So think about that. Think about that because being having a transparent process where the customer watches you work, that's the experience value. And, and how people get to see the craftsmen do their craft is really, really valuable. Then we have the results value or the value of outcome. This is the value of what people extract from what you do. So you have to concentrate on figuring out what is it that you do that the clients get value from and you use that to price because that's the biggest opportunity you have to create uh, value is to understand what the outcome does for them. My work allows you to take a vacation, priceless. My work lets you sleep at night, priceless. My work gets you compliant. My work allows you to have better information about your business so you can concentrate on what you love or, and, or, or the reasons why you want in the business in the first place. Priceless. That's the results value, what the outcome of our work does. Then we have the membership value. This is how, how it feels to be part of that business, how it feels to do business with that person, how it feels to be part of that group. Why do people go to Harvard? Why do people go to Harvard? Is it because of the great education? Maybe, but there's many other universities that give you the same education for half or a third of the price. People do it because of the membership value, being part of that alumni association and the bragging rights of being a Harvard alumni has a long brand. You need to have membership value on the services that you provide. People need to be proud to be working with you and your firm. And the last one is the tail value or the post service value. This is how people feel. So how people feel that the value that they can get from working with you way after the service is done, right? Is this person going to be there in business alive 10 years from now when I need him to ask him a question about something that did 10 years ago? That's a really important opportunity to create value that happens at the tail end. Okay, so let's talk about a typical complex project because it's the biggest uh, pushback I get from people for value pricing, which is it's too difficult to use, especially for complex projects. So I'm going to give you a quick project example, and I'm going to ask you a poll question about it. So a typical complex project, messy QuickBooks file, beginning balances don't tie, some of the source documents are missing, there may or may not be a cash-based transaction and there's no petty cash log. We'll find out. There may be some income and expenses that happen in some other accounts or outside the business accounts. Accounts receivable, accounts payable, uh, undeposited funds, inventory, that's undeposited funds, by the way, seems off. 
Some additional accounts will show up later. Who knows? Uh, the client wants you to wants to access their books while you're working. This is what a typical. Th this is very typical of the stuff that I do. So, how would you price a complex project like this? Let me launch a polling question to get an idea, more or less, of how people feel about that. And I would love to see in the in the comment section, uh, in the questions, you know, whether or not this does feel like a typical complex project that's very difficult uh, to price. So uh, answer the polling question and also put in the questions or uh, comments if you think this is a typical complex project that it does come along, you know, very, I mean, like when I tell this to, when I talk to accountants, they say, yeah, welcome to my world. This is exactly what I have to do with every day. And this is why it's so hard to price. So how would you price <laughs> something like this? How would you price uh, something like this? Okay, so um, we're getting answers all over the place. This is great. Um, you know, we have over 500 people in the webinar live answering the polling question. So I think it'll be very interesting for everyone to see uh, the results for this. So the polling question is up. Please answer it if you want your CPE certificate. We have about 90% of the votes. Please answer this. We have a lot of comments of people saying, yes, this is exactly what the typical project looks like. This sounds exactly like what I'm dealing with right now. Typical new client. This is great. Awesome. Sounds like I know what, I, what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I do this for a living too. <laughs> so we're, we're on the same boat. Okay. So let me, um, let me hit, uh, let me close the poll and let me share the results. I think it'll be interesting to see what the results look like. So it looks like 28% uh, of you will give three flat fees based on the desired outcome. I think, honestly, that's probably the best option. 19% uh, of you would give one flat fee based on a long scope conversation. That's, that's what I do, actually, for the most part. 18% of you would only do hourly, and 19% of you are not sure, but also uh, tend to move uh, hourly. Okay, yeah, so this is, uh, this is great. I mean, obviously, there's more options here on, on the pricing part, but I think that... Uh, those options kind of encompass the three. So I'm going to show you what I think is one of the best tools I have ever learned about uh, pricing the unknown. And that, that, that project that we just discussed is a typical pricing of the unknown. So the best tool is called Chris Marston's Concentric Circles or Circles of Scope. And what you do is you sit down in front of your client, and especially when your client wants a flat fee or where you want a flat fee. So when you where where they want a flat fee, where you want a flat fee. Let's, let's say that um, you know, we want to price that project in a flat fee, but we want to have a conversation with their client so they feel our pain and we feel their pain and it all happens simultaneously. And trust me, pay close attention to this. This is one of the best tools I ever learned. So what you do is you draw four circles, a small circle, uh, a slightly bigger circle, and so forth, and you make the circles bigger and bigger. And you label the first circle, yes, Likely, maybe, and what the and WTH. Okay, what WTH means who the hell knows? Who the hell knows? <laughs> so you so you draw this four circles and say, okay, let's talk about what we yes, this is definitely what I can price because it's what I know. Then let's talk about what is likely to happen and tell you how I, I would price that. Let me tell you what may happen and let me tell you who the hell knows it could happen because you know I've had this issue before. So what you do is you start with the yes work and you start talking about, okay, what do we know? What, what are the facts that we know? What's for sure? Well, we know there's three bank accounts that I need to reconcile. We know that there's one credit card account we need to reconcile. We know that there's 200 transactions per month. Let me, um, let me do something here real quick, make it a little bit easier. Uh, I should have done this before because I, I don't want to uh, confuse folks here. So I'm going to just uh, fix this uh, slide here so they only come in uh one at a time so whoops so this, this should be easier to read so let's start with yes okay so just look at the yes so we know that there's 500 handwritten checks no cash transactions we know so we talk about what we know and we say these are all the things that we know these are the facts of the case these are all the things that you're coming uh um that you're coming uh to me towards these are all the documents that you're bringing to me now this is what we know now let's talk about 
what it's likely to happen, okay? Uh, we may have more bank accounts added in the process because you're telling me there isn't any more, but it's likely that more will show up. Uh, this, it's likely that the number of transactions will increase, that it will go from 200 to 300 to 500, whatever happens. It's also likely that there will be more handwritten checks than the ones that we have identified. It is likely that there will be some cash transactions that you will come up with later on. You're going to come up with these receipts or whatever. It's likely that, um, you know, we, we will send you, uh, we will get a letter from someone saying, hey, can, you know, can, can I ask you a question about these financial statements that you're putting together with me? And then what this does is as you go along and you go, yes, likely, maybe, people start thinking, huh, this person knows what they're doing. This person has done this before. And that is the best outcome that you can get from this. A customer gets, gets a feeling that you know what you're doing, even though this is a complicated project. Instead of telling the, cl the client, I don't know how to price it, it's complicated, let's go through this exercise. So now we go through the maybe work. You know, maybe you will add a PayPal account or some sort of non you know, traditional banking electronic payment system. Maybe there's a new person handwriting checks and we don't even know what their handwriting means. You know, maybe there are some employee reimbursement reports that need to be created. Maybe we have to adjust uh, the payroll reports. Uh, maybe there's another um, accountant that asks us to reclassify a bunch of stuff because it doesn't match the tax return of what they're doing. Maybe we have to take another accountant's report and, and reconcile it or try to adjust it. And who the hell knows? Maybe you did some Bitcoin transactions. Maybe some people will have Macs and have to remote into a Mac and I don't even know how to work in a Mac. You know, maybe you change your business model or your transformation model in the middle of the year and what seemed to be a pattern is not there anymore. Maybe, you know, there's a new owner, uh, the, 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 the owner or the person that handle the transactions is not available and then some new clueless person is the one you're asking stuff to and they have no idea what's going on. Maybe you'll get an audit and I have to retain the records. Maybe the data gets corrupted in the middle of the work. So this is how we take, we take complex projects and we have this talk with the conversation. Yes, likely, maybe. And the, cust and the customer will always, agree. even and you, every one of these lines is an opportunity for the customer to come in. The customer will say, absolutely, I don't have Bitcoin. I will never do Bitcoin. Whatever it happens to be, the customer will give you information as you do this exercise. Then what you do is you say, you know what? The way I would price yes work hourly, because it takes me about four hours a month, would be $500 a month, right? Because so I can actually price yes work hourly. And that's okay, right? Because it's the yes work. But I have to now take my likely work so again, assuming that all these uh, things on the likely pile show up, I'm probably going to raise it $250 if that shows up. And then if everything from the maybe pile shows up, I'm going to add $500 to that service. And then if everything on the what the hell knows category shows up, uh, I'm going to have to add $1,000 to that, to that price. But then we take the probabilities of them happening. You can use 60, 25, and 10%. You could come up with these percentages on your own, which is great because you're making up this whole thing <laughs> as you go. You add the percentages and you use them to come up with your effective price. And I got to tell you, you use this and your client will not, will not rebut. I mean, if they can't afford it, they can't afford it, fine. But the, the way you can come up with the price makes so much sense. And, and you can do this, this pricing part, you can do it with your client or you can do it without your client. You can practice both, but it is a way to make you feel that, yes, I am pricing this in some sort of uh, logical way. So I'm going to leave it open for questions. Uh, I'm going to run the fourth polling question here, and then I'll, I'll spend the last uh, couple of minutes answering questions. And I'll talk about the webinar that I have coming up, which uses this foundation and obviously goes a lot deeper. So hopefully I added enough value here to convince you to spend $200 on a paid webinar for three hours. But, um, but uh, yes, I mean, after four or five years of doing QB Power Hour, I never really sold any of my content. I've always shared my content for free. So I wanted to create something that's unique, something that's fantastic, something that comes from uh, the heart and my experience. And I put that together, but unfortunately it's like four hours worth of content. So I, Figured I'll give one away in here and then the rest I'll sell. Uh, let's see. Let's go through some questions. So, so one person says, where do I even start with pricing a complex project like that? And I was about to answer that, but then she commented, okay, now I know where to start. 
<laughs> I think that's great. Um, I think another, uh, some comments here, a few people are saying that with the concentric circles, the most valuable piece is the conversation you have with your client. That's actually, I think it's really good. Um, you know, th that conversation that you have while talking about those things are the really, really uh, I important. Now, the, the, the funny thing about the concentric circles, it's a justification of price based on effort, right? Because we are uh, doing the effort. But the problem is that this is not technically a justification of price because we're using percentages to estimate, which means that we're taking the risk. So yes, we are justifying our time and our resources to price, but we're not pricing based on the specific time and resources. We are pricing based on the probability that we will use those resources and we're giving them a fixed price, which is actually the most important value for it. Um, okay, uh, somebody says, how would you refund your services if, uh, would you, ref okay, great question. Would you refund the services if the things don't come up? The answer is no, absolutely not. You're pricing as a fixed price because you will take care of it if it shows up and you don't need to do it if it doesn't show up. Okay, so let me close uh, the polling question and um, just give me two more minutes uh, to make my pitch one more time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some value pricing principles on the presentation of this webinar. So number one, I'm adding price, I'm adding value up front, I'm adding positioning value, and I'm adding understanding value by stating the case of what my services will be. So that's one of the things that I did to add value to the presentation of this paid webinar. Uh, I've also, I'm also giving you options, right? I'm saying you can pay $300 or you can pay $200 depending on when you pay it. And, um, and, and I'm giving you a uh, tail value or membership value by giving you access to the recording. So I I'm just trying to use the principles of value pricing to present uh, the three hour webinar that I'm selling. So if you want to register for that, go to valuepricing.net. It will take you straight into my course page. Use July 100 to get $100 off. And I hope to see you in, uh, in that webinar. Next, uh, next episode will be on August 9th. Not 100% sure what the topic will be. It will probably be QuickBooks Online. Um, on the 23rd, again, we're going to talk about sales tax challenges, post Wayfair, especially for e-commerce people selling all over the country. And hopefully on September 6th, we'll be able to do QuickBooks 2019. Uh, if you have no other questions, um, I will uh, bid you farewell and I hope to see you in a couple of weeks.